So I've asked one of our teachers to talk to you because I knew he would do a great job and you would enjoy hearing from him. This is Roddy Story who teaches history and coaches junior school football and baseball. Roddy is a 2000 graduate of MBA. He then matriculated at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He returned to intern and actually worked with me uh, at MBA in the 2004-2005 school year. He went back to Chapel Hill the next year and uh, finished an MA in history and education. And then he taught in North Carolina for the next nine years in the public schools. And he and I occasionally would visit and I talked to him about how I wanted him to come back to MBA one day. And he called me the year before last and said he was ready, as our song said, to come home. So uh, I'm very proud to introduce Roddy to you today. Please join me in welcoming Roddy Story. Good afternoon. In 1994, I was sitting where you are as, incoming, as an incoming seventh grader with my family at a new family picnic just like this one. I think Mr. Joya arranged for Amy Grant to sing for us. And I'm hoping for a surprise performer tonight as well. Uh, there's whispers that it might be Rihanna. Um, but before Rihanna and Drake uh, come out here and get to work, I thought we might spend some time talking about Teddy Roosevelt. I'm not sure those three people have ever been shown in succession before. In 1867, at the age of nine, Teddy was putting the finishing touches on his first written piece called A Natural History on Insects. Perhaps a misleading title considering his observations gave equal time to insects, hawks, snakes, and frogs. I think he may have discussed a woodchuck as well. To write this text, Teddy believed that he must observe all of these critters uh, in action for some period of time and then dissect them later. It was during this year that he declared his home at 28 East 20th Street in Manhattan to be the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. One of his worst floggings came shortly thereafter when at a dinner party, a member of the Roosevelt staff poured a brown snake out of a sterling water pitcher and into a guest's lap. Frogs live between couch cushions and in cupboards, but Teddy always made certain to know the whereabouts of his snapping turtle by tying it to the legs of his sink. About this time, Teddy began experimenting with taxidermy, and at the age of 12, he donated a dozen mice, a bat, a turtle, four bird's eggs, and the skull of a red squirrel from the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History to the American Museum of Natural History. By the time he attended Harvard for college, many considered him to be the preeminent taxidermist in the entire country. It should not have come to a surprise to anyone that Roosevelt would later sign executive orders establishing 150 national forests, 51 bird preserves, and four game preserves. He simply stayed true to the intellectual pursuits of his youth. In front of a crowd in Chicago in 1899, TR idealized the value of hard work. Here's an excerpt. I wish to preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of, a, of the strenuous life, the life of toil and effort, of labor and strife, to preach that highest form of success which comes, not to the man who desires mere e easy peace, but to the man who does not shrink from danger, from hardship, or from bitter toil, and who out of these wins the splendid ultimate triumph. T.R. had long known the virtues of hard work. As a boy, Teddy became frustrated with a doctor's frequent prescriptions of bed rest to ease his severe asthma. Instead of following doctor's orders, Teddy theorized that he should exercise as much as possible. So if he expanded his chest, that would, give, uh, that would better accommodate his, his fragile lungs. His father obliged and transformed the second floor of their brownstone into a gymnasium. The sickly young boy turned into a small but powerful young man and soon took an interest in boxing. In a match against a taller, more experienced boxer at Harvard, T.R. finished a match with his face completely bloodied, and though he lost the bout, a spectator wrote that his spirit did not flag. 
that unflagging spirit would serve Roosevelt throughout his 60 years of life. When he first reached the West, the locals mocked his tailor-made buckskin suit and his hunting knife made by Tiffany's. But by 1886, T.R. had become quite the frontiersman. He built a ranch and named it Elkhorn on the Little Missouri River in North Dakota. He spent so much time in the West that he served as the deputy sheriff of Billings County, a position he took very seriously. On the morning of March 24th, Roosevelt awoke to find his boat missing, a scow that he appraised to be worth $30. Because of the high snow banks, he was unable to follow the thieves on horseback, so he sent his ranch hand into town for a box of nails. Three days later, T.R. had himself a new boat. A blizzard promptly set in, which delayed his departure by another three days. On March 30th, Roosevelt and two ranch hands set off to find the thieves who now had a six-day head start. T.R. brought with him three essentials for the ride, a rifle, a camera, and a copy of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. After three days of travel in Arctic conditions, they found the boat and captured the thieves. Roosevelt now had three bound thieves, two boats, and two ranch hands 150 miles away from the closest town. Five of the six men were certain of the outcome. The thieves would be executed right then and there. But Roosevelt would not allow it. His ethics would not allow it. His sense of justice would not allow it. The death penalty was not a suitable punishment for the theft of a $30 boat. Roosevelt would see that the thieves received justice according to due process of law. Roosevelt describes the ensuing journey as eight of the most grueling days of his life. Roosevelt writes, so after 36 hours sleeplessness, I was most heartily glad when we at last jolted into the long straggling main street of Dickinson and I was able to give my unwilling companions to the sheriff. Under the laws of Dakota, I received my fees as a deputy sheriff for making the arrests and also mileage for the 300 miles gone over, a total of some $50. He also managed to read the entirety of Anna Karenina. Many admire Roosevelt's successes. I admire his interests, his efforts, and his ethics. Roosevelt died at the age of 60, but historians credit him for living three lifetimes during those years. He never wasted a minute. Men, it's time to live like TR. And we will give you the support and the resources to do it. The next year of your life is so important because you, you begin to find out what you love to do. And you need to start figuring that out right away. Become part of a team. Compose a piece of music act in the play, paint a work of art, debate Hillary Trump with your friends, speak French to a girl, <laughs> go fishing with your friends, tutor someone, prepare breakfast for a stranger. Do all of these things. If you don't do all of these things, you will be guaranteeing yourself that you're missing out on something. It's your turn. It's time to be independent. It's time to live the strenuous life. The next years of your life will offer you countless opportunities. Get off your daggum phone, turn off your Xbox, and take advantage of these opportunities. What you do this year will shape what you do in the decades to come. <laughs> there is a young man who sat in the audience last year and will be in the eighth grade this year. He excelled in the classroom, he was the most improved player on the football team. He was one of the toughest members on the wrestling team. He acted in the junior school production of Robin Hood. He, overcome, he overcame the obstacle of getting cut from the baseball team and then threw shot put and discus for the track team. He plays guitar and he writes his own music. That's a pretty good year. That's a Teddy Roosevelt kind of year. That's what I want my son to be like. And that's what we want all of you to be like. I grew up on Estes, and when I was your age, I thought there was a school like MBA at the end of every street. Well, there's not. I had no idea that I was one of the luckiest people on the entire planet. I realize it now, and I hope you do as well. 
Men, you get to live in the United States and you get to go to MBA. And those are two things we should not ever take for granted. Before you go to sleep tonight, you should take a minute to talk to your parents to thank, to thank them for helping you get to this point because you would not be here without them. But you should also take a minute to tell them that you can take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank you.